The state prison system using convict labor began building the Texas State Railroad back in the late 1800s to serve an iron furnace and other industries near Rusk in East Texas. After hard times brought the closing of the furnace, the line saw about 50 years of irregular service and fell into disrepair. 1972, when the bulk of the Texas State Railroad was conveyed to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, convict labor again played an important role in rebuilding the 25 miles of track, creating an historic park dedicated to the preservation of steam locomotives and railroading's golden age. This is engine number 500 here on the State Railroad. We acquired the engine from the city of San Angelo from the museum they had there back in 1980. A little over a year in rebuilding, we uh, started operating the locomotive in 1981, uh, put it into regular operation in early 82. Now, this locomotive here weighs 138 tons. The tender back behind weighs an additional 100 tons when it's full of fuel and water. So you're looking at a pretty good sized locomotive for this line. It was the first locomotive that we completely rebuilt ourselves. Uh, other locomotives we had contracted out to outside firms, but we're rather proud of this one. We were able to do all the work ourselves on this one. Engine 500 is just one of the completely restored steam locomotives you'll find in operation at the park. Each scheduled run has a train leaving from each of the Victorian-style depots at Palestine and Rusk for a three-hour round trip through the piney woods of East Texas. Passengers who arrive early can walk through the cab of the engine and take a closer look at a thundering giant from our past. Now it's time to find a seat, listen for the whistle, and take a trip back in time. With the faithful, eloquent voice of the engine as the fuel of imagination, you can see the reality of space-age technology take a back seat to images of an era long since past when the railroad was king. It's a unique adventure for young and old alike, creating a wealth of new experience for some and bringing back special memories for others. When I used to read a story, especially when it was going, I think I can, I think I can, a while ago. <laughs> Stories for the children. And I did ride the train when I was real young. I'm really enjoying it. To me, when I was a kid, go from Fort Worth to visit uh, my dad's people up in Cumberland, Tennessee, and we had to spend two nights on the train to get up there. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> About as fast as this. <laughs> he liked going through the engine. I think he kind of backed up from the steam, though. I like antiques, so this just brings me right back to what I like.
The Texas State Railroad is one of the state's most popular historic sites, and right now reservations are recommended for a guaranteed seat. For timetables, reservations, tickets, and more information, you can contact either the Rusk or Palestine Depot directly. There's a lot of characteristics that a bow hunter has, but basically it's the degree of challenge that you want. With a gun, you have to be, you have to know that buck within 200 yards, say. Well, with the bow, you know, you're talking about 50 yards. You gotta get close enough you had to know that buck well enough to get within 50 yards, and that's the tough part. <laughs> Big flat open meadow, one bush in the middle of it. And I'm walking across it, because where I'm going to on the far side and off the hill. And I get right out there by that bush, and I see a deer standing out there in the trees. Well, I hit the ground, you know. Get down on one knee, and I'm looking at him. And the wind's just blowing just 90 miles an hour, and he not even paying any attention to me or anything else. So I stand up real easy, pull back on it, and I'm it's 50 yards out there, but he's a nice one. And good crosswind, so I allow a little bit for the wind and put it right on his tail. That's where he hit. <laughs> <laughs> the wind quit blowing at that time when I let it go. <laughs> It's hard to explain to somebody how you've been out hunting and saw 33 deer and only shot one time and hadn't got anything. <laughs> hunting with a bow represents a formidable challenge. It takes a special kind of hunter willing to face overwhelming odds, where failure is the rule and success is the exception. Personally, I hunt more for the challenge. Meat on the table is fine, but if that's what I wanted, I would hunt with a gun. Practice with the bow and arrow is extremely important because it is necessary to be as accurate or precise as possible with bow and arrow, which is a low velocity projectile. Accurate placement must be made in the vital area of the deer whereas high-powered weapons, due to their tremendous velocity and impact, shot placement is not as important. I normally start practicing several months before the season, initially starting on a weekly basis and then trying to get it onto a daily basis. And it normally takes hours and days upon days of practice to get in shape, even if you've done it in prior years. Your hunt area is defined by the road to turn to the left down here, across this creek, mm -hmm. the one that goes up on top, right up on top of that mountain right there. That's this road here. South. Bow hunting on selected wildlife management areas across the state is one of the many recreational opportunities for Texans provided by the Texas Parks and Wildlife okay. Department. Good luck to you. The greatest defense that the deer has, of course, is his acute senses of smell, hearing, and sight. And a hunter or predator must overcome these senses, and he must overwhelm not just one, but all of the senses. The hunter has to blend in with the habitat, blend in with the environment, and has to know a lot about animal behavior, or deer behavior in this case, in order to be successful. Camouflage is important to the bow hunter because he's trying to overcome the deer's sight. You are blending in with the environment, blending in with the habitat, and uh, a white face, so to speak, in the environment is not natural. I experience a tremendous sense of relief and satisfaction of being in the woods, of being with nature. It just seems to resolve the anxieties of life. They sort of fade away when I'm out in the woods. Understanding the habitat 
is very important in determining where deer will or will not be. Deer have certain areas that they feed, certain areas in that habitat that they bed. When you're scouting, you're, you're trying to learn the routines or the patterns of the deer, and this is largely accomplished by looking at tracks or trails to determine where these movements are on a particular area. Deer droppings or pellets are indications to a bow hunter that the deer has been there at some point in time. What a bow hunter is looking for is the freshness of the pellets, similar to any other design, whether it's old or new. A rub on a small sapling is generally a good indication that a buck has visited that area. It's his way of marking his territory and it's also his way of polishing his antlers. When moving in on a deer, I try to take one or two steps possibly at a time, always watching the deer to see if the deer is looking in my direction, if his senses are detecting me at all. If his head is down feeding or if he's looking away, I'll take a few more steps, but I'm always watching the animal to make sure that if his head starts to come up, I'm stationary. I think the most important elements of a bow hunter being successful involve years and years of experience. The bow hunter has to be in full control of not only himself but be knowledgeable of everything that's going on around him such that he is really part of the environment and when he makes his final approach it's almost like it's intuitive what he does. Taking advantage of the wind, not making any fast movements or breaking a twig. At that last moment, a decision has to be made at that time whether to release the arrow or not. If the deer is looking at you, the deer is going to jump the string. If for some reason I don't have a good shot at that vital area, I don't shoot. Because I really feel that bow hunters have a responsibility to not wound animals. And if you cannot hit that vital area, then you should not shoot. There is a certain amount of disappointment, but on the other hand, I feel good in the respect that I did not take a chance at making a bad shot and that's important to me. Even if I don't take the animal, the hunt is a success. I've done what I enjoy doing. I've been in the woods. Uh, I've been away from the everyday life. But I've been subjected to a, to a challenge. Last year, of the 242 hunters who participated in public hunts on wildlife management areas, only 16 were successful in taking a deer. This represents over 30 days of recreation for every deer harvested. As wildlife habitat continues to diminish, bow hunting might be a way to meet the ever-increasing demand for hunting while placing minimal stress on the environment. In 
Clinic's hospitable place, where only the hardiest plants and animals survive. Here in the shelter provided by caves carved into the limestone by the ancient waters of tributaries to the Rio Grande, live some of the first Texans 10,000 years ago. Although these early Texans and their culture have long since passed, their story has been preserved on the walls of these caverns and shelters. The significance of these rock paintings went largely unnoticed until 1934, when Forrest and Lula Kirkland, both trained commercial artists and amateur archaeologists, discovered a site at Paint Rock and realized that this fragile record of these ancient cultures needed to be recorded and preserved. Thus began their quest to record as many prehistoric paintings as possible until Forrest's death in 1942. The Kirkland's insatiable drive to capture the artwork of the ancient peoples of Texas took them from one end of the state to the other, often enduring great hardship. Dwarfed by monolithic walls of ancient rock, drenched by torrential rain, stooped from tortuous climbing, and squinting to capture every prehistoric detail, Forrest and Lula Kirkland used every free moment they could steal from an active business to successfully reproduce for all time the creative expressions of a vanished, nameless people. To make sure that his reproductions were accurate, Forrest Kirkland began by measuring the rock surface. After drawing the outline, he would measure and pencil in the design to scale. The finer detail was carefully copied freehand. The drawings were then colored as nearly like the original Indian paintings as far as skill and colors allowed. His devotion to accuracy was so urgent that he even used the native clays most probably used by the original artists themselves to reproduce the grays, rust, and lemon yellows he discovered on the cliffs and grottoes before which he labored. These pictographs represent magical mysteries known only to their creators, religious rites long dead, historical records, and fanciful markings. Varied as the farms and their meanings certainly are, they share one common characteristic, their vulnerability to the elements of nature and the destructive hands of indifferent passers-by. They are rare, irreplaceable artifacts of human beings who recorded the steps of their lives for the children of their children a thousand times removed to wonder at. Imposing shaman figures painted from scaffolding and fanciful herds of deer. Stylized handprints left like signets on the walls of elevated shelters. All await the erosion brought by rising midden ash, seep springs leaking through the ceilings of vaulted shelters, and the engravings of vandals. We spend a lot of time going out looking at sites that were very well photographed and drawn in the 1930s. And there, you can't find them today. All you'll find on the wall is a trace. And I think it's a tragedy because it's like any great art or any great uh, view of somebody's culture, especially the pictographs. Most archaeologists have nothing to work with but stone tools and bones and, and very few things. And out here, you've got a chance to look at the people's ideology and their religion and their thought processes in the rock art. The true value of the long hours the Kirklands and others have spent in studying and recording this ancient art can be realized only when it is available for everyone to see. At Seminole Canyon, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has built an historic park making public access to these formerly hidden shelters possible through guided tours of the canyon, hiking trails, and exhibits. In the park headquarters, the visitor is treated to life-size dioramas depicting the lives of these early Texans as well as their rock art. And I don't know anybody who's come here who hasn't left this park with a greater appreciation for their past. You have to gain respect for the people that you used to think were primitive, primitive savages, and yet they have this uh, wonderful mythological and aesthetic world. This is the heritage of the whole state, and it belongs to all the people that live in the state. 
And if they can become exposed to their heritage, they're much more likely to be concerned about taking care of it. That you going fishing all of the time, baby going fishing too. That's your life, your sweet wife, catch more fish than you. Landing a big redfish can be one of the greatest challenges a coastal fisherman can experience. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department is the official agency responsible for managing fisheries resources in the state of Texas. This includes work to enhance the state's once dwindling red drum population. The John Wilson Marine Fish Hatchery in Flower Bluff near Corpus Christi is the first production saltwater fish hatchery in the state and part of the department's continuing effort to manage Texas fishing resources. In in the case of our freshwater reservoirs, we, we're trying to bring as many species into the state as we can to provide different types of recreational fishing opportunity for all the citizens. Uh, in the case of the marine environment, um, our specific purpose is to increase the number of red drum that, that are in the, in the bays. Uh, we have evidence that the stocks of red drum have been declining for a number of years due to overharvest. Uh, there are years that we do not have good recruitment or that we do not get a lot of young red drum coming into the, into the bays. One of the purposes of the saltwater fish hatchery is to try to, to smooth out the peaks and the valleys and try to get a more consistent production in the, uh, in the bays from year to year. The devastating effects of the freeze of 1983 will continue to haunt the efforts of hatchery biologists. Coastal bays were hit so hard that it will take years for marine life to fully recover. But the science of enhancing saltwater fish populations has been under study for some time. It was at the department's marine research lab in Palacios that research on propagating redfish was directed at large-scale production. And techniques have been developed which allow biologists to identify hatchery spawned fish in the wild. We had some basic evidence to show that A, there was a need to put, to uh, increase the numbers of red drum in the bays and that we did have the technology to produce them and we had some information to show that if we did put them out there they would survive and uh, so we had basically all the answers to the questions and it, the only thing that was holding us back was a production fish hatchery that could turn out large numbers of those individuals uh, for introducing into the bays. Enter the Gulf Coast Conservation Association and Central Power and Light Company. The Barney M. Davis Power Station in Flower Bluff is a 650 megawatt, two unit gas power generating station, which draws its cooling water through a 3,850 foot intake channel from the Laguna Madre. A sophisticated screening process using an extremely fine one millimeter mesh developed in Europe retrieves marine life from the intake channel water. Then vortex-induced fish pumps transfer the organisms to the 1,130-acre cooling reservoir. CPNL donated the land for the hatchery, provided thermally enriched water from the cooling reservoir for the hatchery ponds, and has provided the red drum broodstock. The Gulf Coast Conservation Association, actively working for our saltwater conservation, donated the funds to construct the hatchery facility, which is capable of producing 11 to 13 million fingerlings each year. Department biologists manipulate the light and temperature in the spawning chambers and create a condensed artificial spawning cycle of 150 days so the broodfish will spawn more than once a year. Each time the fish spawn, fertilized eggs float to the surface and are concentrated and collected for incubation. At an average of 1,000 eggs per milliliter, parks and wildlife biologists can estimate the total number of eggs produced in a spawn. This counting process occurs during the earliest stages of cellular development, immediately following fertilization. Most of these red drum eggs are in the 8 to 16 cell stage. The oil globule you see serves as their source of nutrients. After counting, the eggs are transferred to 500 gallon incubation tanks and subjected to gentle aeration, simulating natural wave action. During a 72 hour incubation period, the eggs will continue to grow. If you look closely, you can even see the heart beating.
Even after they hatch, incubation continues until they have functional mouths and eyes and are capable of feeding on microscopic zooplankton in the hatchery ponds. The John Wilson Hatchery has 10 two-acre ponds with a combined capacity of three to six million fingerlings. These ponds are filled with thermally enriched salt water and fertilized with alfalfa before the fry are transferred from the incubation tanks. When the fry are capable of feeding, they're transferred to the fertilized ponds and held for about 45 days. This period allows them to develop into fingerlings approximately one inch long, ready for stocking in the bay. Red drum fingerlings are currently being stocked in two bays, Espiritu Santo and Oasis Bay, determined by department biologists to be capable of supporting the animals. Texas parks and wildlife biologists are currently looking closely for genetic impacts and improved production methods, as well as studying additional species for production. The idea of, of placing fish in the bays at a large size, relatively large size, an inch, as compared to waiting for them to get into the bays from the Gulf of Mexico where they're spawned uh, as very, very young fish, and essentially bypassing some of that natural mortality seems to address the fact that, that man is here, he catches the fish, and adds an, an additional mortality that would not occur if he were not here. Research efforts for Red Drum will continue. With statistics indicating a good survival rate for the hatchery-raised fingerlings, work at the John Wilson Hatchery represents a positive step toward enhancing sport fishing in Texas bays. Made in Texas is a presentation of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. For more information or a subscription to the Texas Parks and Wildlife magazine, call toll-free 1-800-792-1112.